In this lecture, we will be examining the rise of the Dutch East India Company. No European trading company or governmental operation handled as much cargo from Asian trading ports than the Dutch East India Company in the 17th and 18th century. A due in large measure to the wealth that was generated by the Dutch East India Company, the 17th century is popularly known as the Dutch Golden Age. The imperial efforts of the Dutch got their start through the work of Jan Huyken van Linschoten, which is pictured here. He was a Dutch Protestant merchant, traveler, and writer. Linschoten first traveled overseas working in the Portuguese Estado de India. He traveled as an assistant to the Archbishop of Goa, and he secretly copied maps, nautical charts, and recorded detailed information about trade in the Indian Ocean Basin. After he returned to Europe, he composed a book that was published in 1596 and which found a wide audience among European merchants, bankers, and political leaders. Among Lyndon Shelton's main points was that, contrary to the impression of most Europeans, the Portuguese empire was quite vulnerable, that it had heavy military expenses that was weighing it down, and that the Portuguese were weakest in the Indonesian archipelago. The first major expedition by the Dutch to the Indian Ocean Basin was led by Cornelius Houtman. The voyage was fraught with troubles, and the difficulties the Dutch experienced were compounded by the abrasive personality of Houtman, who seemingly alienated everyone with whom he came into contact. Despite the fact that only 89 of the original 249 men survived the 15-month ordeal, the Dutch investors were quite pleased that Houtman's voyage netted a small profit via the 249 sacks of pepper, 45 tons of nutmeg, and 30 bales of mace brought back to Amsterdam. The Dutch were now literally and figuratively on the map as trading powers in Asia. Dutch investors began to scramble to tap into the potential profits of the Indian Ocean trade. Five new companies formed in different Dutch towns over the next year, and during the next five years, a total of 70 Dutch ships departed for the Indian Ocean Basin. Some of these vessels returned with goods generating profits as high as 400%. However, the uncontrolled influx of spices and other luxury goods in the Netherlands fell precipitously, and Dutch political leaders decided that they needed to find a way to maintain prices and regulate the supply of overseas goods. The solution that Dutch leaders settled on was the creation of a single national monopoly company, which was known as the Dutch East India Company. The company is often referred to by the initials VOC, which stands for Veringe Oostindisch Compagnie. The VOC was formed in 1602 to manage Dutch overseas expansion, and it was the world's first joint stock company, arguably the, world, the world's first multinational corporation as well. The Dutch government gave the VOC a trade monopoly in all regions east of the Cape of Good Hope in southern Africa to the Straits of Magellan, at the southern end of South America. The VOC possessed quasi-governmental powers. The company could create colonies, wage war, mint coins, and even negotiate treaties on behalf of the Dutch government. The image on this slide is a depiction of a Dutch East India Company factory in Bengal. The date of the painting is approximately 1665. The Dutch entered the Indian Ocean trade network with a few advantages over the Portuguese competitors. Local rulers, for example, initially welcomed the Dutch as a counterweight to the Portuguese and the Estado de India. The Dutch initially found it rather easy to negotiate treaties and contracts with indigenous rulers who were tired of the Portuguese and their system. The Dutch decentralized corporate system with the VOC was much more efficient than the royal administration of the Estado de India where decisions sometimes took years to make. The VOC, in addition, did not have the strict divisions of social class that emerged in the Portuguese Estado de India, where ship commanders were almost always from the nobility, and the crew were often peasants, or in some cases, uh, um, ex-prisoners. Since the Dutch were much less interested in missionary work than the Portuguese, local rulers saw the Dutch as less disruptive to the existing social order in many of the regions in which the Dutch showed up. The Dutch also did not have the massive military obligations of the Portuguese, who were attempting to hold on to an empire that stretched thousands of miles in length. Finally, the Dutch focused most of their early efforts on the Indonesian archipelago, 
where Portuguese power was at its weakest. One of the earliest leaders of the VOC, VOC was Jan Peterson Kuhn, who was governor general of the Dutch East Indies from 1618 to 1627. Kuhn's strategy was simple. It was to eliminate middlemen in the trade and to go directly to the source of commodities and broker with the producers. Kuhn employed strong arm tactics in dealing with indigenous resistance and under his leadership, the VOC capital of Batavia was built. The city of Batavia was formerly, as well as uh, latterly, known as the city of Jakarta. Currently, it is the capital of Indonesia. You can see it in the red circle here on the map. Batavia served as the VOC headquarters for over three centuries. The Dutch uh, developed a, a route away from the Malacca Straits, which were controlled by the Portuguese, and Batavia became a center for wealthy Dutch immigrants. Even today, visitors to, to Jakarta can see remnants of the Dutch influence on the city's architecture and design, as well as, uh, in some cases, culture. The image on this slide is an 18th century depiction of the Dutch imperial center of Batavia. Hundreds of colonial era structures built by the Dutch still stand at J in Jakarta. Some of them date back to the early 17th century. Another advantage the Dutch possessed was their development of a new route um, to the Spice Islands. Traveling around the southern tip of Africa, the Dutch used the westerly winds of what was known as the Roaring Forties, the latitudes between 40 and 50 degrees south, to sail to the ar archipelago of Indonesia. The blue dots represent the route typically taken by the Portuguese using the monsoon winds of the Indian Ocean Basin and passing through the Strait of Malacca. The red dots show the new route taken by the Dutch using the Roaring Forties. This new route cut as much as six months off the time spent on a round trip to the Indonesian islands, and the time savings translated into increased profits for the Dutch. There emerged considerable conflict between the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the English in the Indian Ocean um, trade region, and uh, the Amboina Massacre is, uh, is uh, exemplary of this conflict. In 1605, the Dutch conquered the Portuguese fort on the island of Amboina, which is today the island of Ambon in uh, Indonesia. The island had been one of the leading growers of clove trees in the world. The British resented Dutch efforts to monopolize clove production, and they sought to gain entry into these uh, closed clove markets. Under the 1619 Treaty of Defense, the English and Dutch East India companies agreed to provide mutual military aid against indigenous powers. However, repeated violations of the treaty created a great deal of friction between the English and the Dutch. The Dutch, for example, accused the British of causing trouble with the Sultan of Ternate, one of the major powers in the archipelago. Dutch officials also became paranoid that the English were plotting to overthrow them on Amboina. Um, an English soldier was captured and tortured by the Dutch, and to end the torture, he implicated fellow British officials in a plot. The image on this slide is a 17th century illustration from an English account of the torture of these EIC, or East India Company employees, by Dutch interrogators. Um, as a result, 20 English East India Company employees were executed by the Dutch. Some of these employees, by the way, were Japanese. This incident was a source of considerable conflict between the English and the Dutch for most of the next century. Anthony Van Diemen was the Governor General of the Dutch East Indies from 1636 to 1645, overseeing one of the periods of greatest growth for the VOC. In a word, uh, Van Diemen might best be described as ruthless. Under the leadership of Van Diemen, the Dutch improved control of the production of nutmeg, cinnamon, and cloves, as well as their distribution and marketing. Van Diemen led the Dutch effort to establish a Dutch presence on the island of Ceylon to tap into the cinnamon markets and other products produced in Ceylon. Van Diemen also moved the Dutch to develop a stronger presence in what was known as the country trade. This is a term that refers to trading between regions of the Indian Ocean Basin. For example, uh, cotton textile produced in India might be traded in the Indonesian archipelago for spices, thus reducing the amount of uh, gold and silver bullion that the Dutch would need to carry or pay out. The Dutch quickly learned about the potential profits to be found in the lucrative inter-regional trade. 
Under Van Diemen, the Dutch also ramped up their efforts to directly attack Portuguese possessions in Asia. In the 1630s, the Dutch began to directly attack the Portuguese at any point they thought they had advantages. From 1635 to 1643, the VOC engaged in an attempt to blockade the Portuguese holdings in the administrative center of Goa in India. That would be in the map on your left. While the blockade was somewhat effective and disruptive, uh, the Portuguese simply shifted operations to other ports like Ju. The Dutch also never managed to conquer Goa and displace the Portuguese. Between 1638 and 1658, the Dutch engaged in a series of wars to force the Portuguese from Ceylon. Uh, but they had to eventually sign a treaty with the Portuguese, who proved very difficult to remove from the island. They had the Portuguese, that is, had uh, intermarried and had many generations of living on the island. They were very reluctant to leave a place that they called home. And many of them um, had never been to Portugal. They were Portuguese in language and culture, but were quickly becoming um, um, indigenous to Ceylon. Van Diemen and the Dutch were more successful in their campaign to capture the strategic port of Malacca in 1641. You can see that in the map on the right. This prove, provided the Dutch with access to an important shipping channel between the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea. At the time, um, virtually all of the... Um, trade between the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea, or between South Asia and East Asia, passed through the Strait of Malacca, where that uh, double-headed arrow is located on the map. Between 1636 and 1640, also, the Portuguese were expelled from Japan, and the only Westerners permitted to trade in Japan were the Dutch. The Dutch were restricted in their trade with the Japanese to a small artificial island in Nagasaki Harbor, known as Dejima. It's uh, located near the bottom of this map. It's sort of a, uh, a wedge-shaped little piece of, uh, of land. And it looks almost like a pie crust at the very bottom where the ships are headed. The Dutch were not permitted to leave the island or even to take so much as a step in Japanese territory without being accompanied by state officials. Christian religious books and even church services in Dejima were banned by the Japanese, though the Dutch were quite willing to... Um, to make these accommodations as it meant that they had uh, uh, a virtual lock on all trade with Japan and, uh, and the European markets. Finally, the Dutch Cape Colony was founded by Jan van Riebeek as a supply station and a sort of layover port for vessels of the VS, VOC en route to or returning from Asia. Originally, this port was supposed to simply serve as a logistical service and supply station, but quickly, the Cape Colony became a destination for Dutch Calvinists looking to find a new home. These Dutch Calvinists were the origins of the white ethnic group known as Afrikaners in present-day South Africa. Well, this draws to a close our brief look at the rise of the Dutch East India Company.